Tonight, the Boston Marathon bombing suspect continues to tell his story, but his mother is telling a very different story. Police have learned of a possible motive in the Boston Marathon bombing. Why did they do it? We are learning about a motive. Sardin have reportedly told investigators that he and his brother acted alone. The attack was fueled by religious fervor. None of it's been confirmed outside of what he says. Charnayev was read his Miranda rights in a brief bedside session. He nodded most of his answers. Nodded four times to questions, but spoke just one word. When he was asked if he could afford a lawyer, when he spoke the word no. There are still a lot of unanswered questions. The House today will get a class briefing. A Senate committee will question the FBI. The FBI faces questions. There are limits on what can be done. There are ways in which you could further enable the FBI. These are all issues that are going to be developed. I want to get sequestered very quickly in here. A series of automatic, severe budget cuts. Feeling the impact of across the board sequester cuts. What does it mean for the overall debate? FBI agents will be furloughed. This More sequester bickering. was never intended to become law. Changes like this affect our ability to respond to threats. This is as a result of the sequester. These cuts are not smart. They are not fair. This touches, you know, almost every big issue going on in Washington now. Congress has to act. President Obama's early second term domestic agenda. What does it mean for the overall debate? Gun control, the budget, and immigration reform. President Obama is inviting the 20 female senators over for dinner tonight. All of the women senators over for dinner. In hopes of creating a better working relationship with Congress. If you want to create a bipartisan agenda. No real signs of progress evident anywhere. A great place to start is with the women senators. In the Boston bombing investigation, NBC News has learned that the FBI is increasingly confident, their words, increasingly confident that the two suspects acted alone. NBC's Pete Williams reports that Johar Sarnayev has told investigators that he and his brother were motivated by religious fervor and their reaction to the American invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. The suspect's condition was upgraded from fair uh, for, to, from serious to fair today, according to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston. As you know, he was found bleeding in a boat in a driveway in Watertown just outside of Boston. The man who discovered him in that boat, David Henneberry, spoke with Ed Harding of Boston's ABC station WCVB today. I know I took three steps up the ladder. I don't remember stepping down off the ladder. I think I just... This hits you more afterwards when you think, my God... We probably slept last night. This guy could be in the, that. You know, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's, it's surreal. The suspect's two sisters, Alina and Bella Sarnayev, released this statement today that did not include one word of defense of their brothers. Our hearts go out to the victims of last week's bombing. It saddens us to see so many innocent people hurt after such a callous act. As a family, we are absolutely devastated by the sense of loss and sorrow this has caused. We don't have any answers, but we look forward to a thorough investigation and hope to learn more. We ask the media to respect our privacy during this difficult time. But their mother continues to refuse to believe that her sons could have done anything wrong. NBC's British partner ITN spoke with the suspect's mother by phone. I'm sure that my sons, my, my two boys are not responsible for this. You think that they were there just as spectators, as innocent spectators? Of course. Well, well last year they went too. The suspect's mother then told CNN, their protector is God, who is Allah, the only one, Allah, okay? If they are going to kill him, I don't care. My oldest one has been killed and I don't care. I don't care if my youngest one is going to be killed today. I want the world to hear this and I don't care if I am going to get killed too, okay? And I will say Allah Akbar, that's what I'm going to say. The Wall Street Journal reports tonight that the older brother bought two large pyrotechnic devices in February from a New Hampshire store called Phantom Fireworks. The company's vice president, William Weimer, says Sarnayev purchased two lock and load reloadable mortar kits at the company's Seabrook, New Hampshire store near the Massachusetts border. Each kit contains a tube and 24 shells. Sarnayev paid $199 cash for the kits. NBC's Michael Isakoff reports that a preliminary examination of these cell phones and 
computers used by the Sarnayev brothers has found no indication yet of any accomplices. Investigators say they are now trying to determine whether the older brother obtained money from family members, friends, or other sources. A spokesman for the mosque the brothers attended in Cambridge tells NBC News FBI agents have been questioning members and that the mosque has provided the names of at least three members who saw Tamerlan disrupt services at the mosque. The most recent was on Martin Luther King Day. He called a speaker a non-believer and a hypocrite because he compared Martin Luther King to the prophet Muhammad. Leaders of the congregation told him he should not come back if he was going to disrupt services. He did return in the last month, but didn't cause any more problems. Joining me now is NBC News terrorism analyst Michael Leiter, former director of the National Counterterrorism uh, Center under Presidents Bush and Obama, and MSNBC's Joy Reid. Michael, what do you make of uh, the totality of the evidence as it exists tonight? Lawrence, I think it's quite clear that the FBI has developed an incredibly strong case here. And what we're seeing, although obviously we can't say for sure yet, it's almost certain that uh, the older brother was the first who was radicalized, um, inspired by the same message that has inspired other homegrown extremists and followers of al-Qaeda, uh, an extremist Sunni uh, Islamic ideology, which is really a warping of the very peaceful Muslim faith, and drove them ultimately to view themselves being at war with the United States and thus targeting innocent civilians. Uh, Joy Reid, I just want to get your reaction to everything as it's unfolded so far. Yeah, I think the mother's statements are pretty incredible, but it, I mean, if, as we're reading the news reports, she wasn't necessarily the person directly parenting uh, these young men. She was, you know, in another country, and so the influence of the, lit, the suspect who's still alive was really his brother, um, who seems to be the first to be radicalized. But it is pretty frightening. I think that we, we tend to want um, ter this to be a sort of terrorist cell, some bigger conspiracy, um, something a lot less frightening than just two otherwise average young men living in the community, raised in the community, and then becoming radicalized just of their own volition and deciding to do something so horrific really in their own community. So it's actually in a lot of ways, you know, more disturbing. Uh, M Michael, uh, what what do you make of the difference in the reactions from uh, their sisters and their mother? Their sister's statement very clearly is uh, they're not making any kind of defensive uh, comment uh, about their brothers. Uh, they seem to be watching uh, what's developed uh, in, in television news and accepting kind of the obvious facts of the case so far. Lawrence, I would say it is true that the sisters are probably closer to this than the mother who's overseas, the father who's overseas. But I have to admit that I have a bit of sympathy. I have a lot of sympathy for the entire family. And, you know, any mother or father who's faced with this, I don't really think that these are especially useful witnesses as to what their child did or did not do and why they did or did not do it. When I, mean, I think you're talking about so much grief and confusion that, again, these are not the witnesses to whom I would I would turn for factual evidence in a case. Uh, Joy, the uh, the fireworks stuff, that's a, you know, this stuff is legal in New Hampshire. It's illegal in Massachusetts. It's very common there. You drive up over the New Hampshire border, you grab this stuff uh, and, and you bring it back. And uh, the question is, is this where they got the totality of the uh, gunpowder? That they used uh, for this uh, bomb making, uh, but the, the the different state laws making different things easier to obtain here than there right. are part of what this story is about. Yeah, and the difficulty of tracking. Uh, you know, you've talked on the show about the the, the tag and issue and not being able to necessarily trace where gunpowder comes from, and just sort of the mundane uh, items that they were able to put together apparently by just going online and figuring out how to make such deadly destructive weapons. They didn't have to obtain some sophisticated equipment. A lot of this was stuff that was relatively easy to obtain. I think that's another issue that we have to look at. But as you said, we have disparate state laws. It's very difficult to police something when each law, each state makes its own laws. Michael, uh, not to judge the credibility of what we're hearing uh, from the suspect, but just to judge the, the probabilities involved. 
Uh, based on everything you've seen, the devices they've used, uh, the story that we learned how to do this from the internet, we uh, were kind of inspired by some of these websites uh, we've gone to uh, with e extremist uh, uh, Islamic clerics who, who are on them and, and these th that stuff. Is there anything you've heard developed from the, from the suspect where you say, ah, oh, no, I, that doesn't sound possible? Uh, this is actually a fairly typical story of homegrown extremists in my experience. Um, we've had a history of homegrown extremists in the United States of having pretty extensive ties here in the United States. Of course, the Fort Hood shooter, Nadal Hassan, who was a major in the Army. Um, the Times Square bomber married two kids, an MBA. So uh, the basic the basic profile of these two is not really inconsistent with what we've seen. And to your point about the internet, almost every homegrown Al-Qaeda-inspired extremist that we've seen in the United States over the past five to six years has really been affected quite significantly by English-speaking extremist um, it preachers online. The most notable one is Anwar Alaki, but there are others throughout the world. And learning how to build the bombs, um, kind of being being attracted to this really virulent ideology which so skews Islam is, is relatively common. And I think uh, it, magazines put out by organizations like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, a magazine known as, known as Inspire, and other places that you can learn to make these bombs. This really is the path that many homegrown extremists have taken, and unfortunately, we've seen it again, I would guess. And Joy, today, the other motivational element added to the mix was the American invasion of right. Afghanistan and then Iraq. Right, and we also learned that the older brother um, was a devotee of the Alex Jones website and conspiracy theory Infowars. So you have this combination of sort of radical ideology, increasing religiosity, but also buying into a lot of conspiracy theories. 9-11 trutherism apparently was a part of the mix. So uh, yeah, it's not just websites that are put out by terrorists overseas or you know terror organizations overseas it's also conspiracy theorizing right here in the US so it is a pretty scary combination Michael uh, at, at different points in our involvement in both Afghanistan and Iraq and other policy choices made since 9-11 there have been concerns raised in Congress and raised by some observers uh, to what extent is what we're doing uh, creating or provoking terrorism versus suppressing terrorism uh, what what is your reaction to, to that calculation of, of uh, suppress versus provoke in what we're looking at in this case? Uh, Lawrence, you're absolutely right. This has been raised for a long time. The, the first most notable uh, person who raised this was Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, who asked in a very famous memo now, now are we killing more terrorists than we're creating? And from my perspective, having looked at radicalization and tried to counter, um, counter the message, uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan are very, very commonly invoked in Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-inspired propaganda to try to recruit um, other individuals to the cause. Although that is undoubtedly true, I, I have to say I think it is difficult to really connect any one individual with these conflicts. There's no doubt, again, um, pictures, video of civilians being killed and the like. This is exactly what Al-Qaeda uses to help radicalize and bring people into the ideological fold. But again, I, I think just pointing to Iraq or Afghanistan is a little bit too simplistic because generally these radicalization cases come from a really dynamic mix of factors. And Joy, the pause that I would put over all of this is, uh, this all depends on you believing right. this suspect in this hospital bed and uh, I for one I'm going to reserve judgment on everything he's saying. Yeah and it is in his interest to say that it was the older brother that it was the now deceased uh, suspect who now cannot counter any of his claims it is very much in his interest as a legal matter to say that he was following what the older brother was doing so I think yeah we have to definitely take what he's saying with that in, uh, to, in account. Joy Reid and Michael Leiter thank you both for joining me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up.